Welcome to the KVC Keynotes, the platform that connects you to thought leaders, change makers, and industry shapers. I am Mei Ying, and today we are joined by Professor Muhammad Yunus, Nobel Laureate, founder of Grameen Bank, and the father of microfinancing, who will be sharing his experiences and advice for coping with the current issues imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. So please remember to make use of the Q&A feature in this keynote. You can submit your questions throughout the discussion for Professor Yunus to address during question time. It is also my great pleasure to welcome Akib Hussein from the KBC Enterprise Department, who will be the host for this evening. Thank you, Mei Ying. Hello, everyone. My name is Akib Hussein, and I wish you a very warm welcome to all of you, and especially to our honorable guest, Professor Mohammed Yunus, who is joining this KBC event from Dhaka. We all know Professor Yunus does not need an introduction. He's the father of both social business and microcredit, the founder of Gameen Bank and of more than either 50 companies in Bangladesh. For his constant innovation and enterprise, the Fortune magazine named Professor Mohammed Yunus the, one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our time in 2012. In 2006, as we all know, Professor Yunus and Grameen Bank were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He's, only, he's the recipient of 61 honorary degrees from universities across 24 countries and received 136 awards from 33 countries. He's only one of seven individuals to have received the Nobel Peace Prize, U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom, and Congressional Gold Medal. Concerning our today's KBC keynote event, the foundation of Grameen Bank started back in 1974 in the village of Chopra during the crisis of Bangladesh famine, where Professor Yunus was able to change the lives of many poor Bangladeshis, especially women, with the application and his pioneering work of microfinance and social business. Hence, we would like to ask and know from Professor Mohammed Yunus, how can we transfer the same concept of social business from a crisis like the Bangladesh famine to the current global pandemic? How can we transfer and unpack social business opportunities to resolve COVID-19 challenges? Now, with the immense sense of gratitude and honor, I would like to request Professor Mohammed Yunus to address the audience for the next 20 minutes. Thank you and don't know what. Don't know what. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, enjoy talking to young people like you. And I'll be just chatting around the issues that I've been facing or I've faced in the past, how we like to uh, respond to those things. I hope this will be uh, interesting and useful to you. Uh, first thing I think I should mention that life plays strange tricks with you. Uh, you think you're doing something, going to do this, and something happens, you're doing completely the thing that you never thought you'd ever do. And that's what happened to me. I always wanted to be a teacher, and I enjoyed teaching, and I did that. And while I was doing, uh, unknowingly I got into something which took me completely different way, which I never thought I would ever consider doing that, banking. Uh, <laughs> and ever since, I'm known as a banker to the core, and founder of bank. So bank and banking became kind of a uh, seal on me that uh, I'm known by that uh, name. But I had no idea that I'll ever get into it. Uh, no, what the circumstances kind of push you into the direction that you never thought it was. The reason I'm mentioning it was the famine in Bangladesh which pushed me into that direction, and uh, I keep mentioning that. Uh, so that was something that's so unbearable uh, to young economic teacher, economics teacher, uh, that he was trying to find the meaning of economics uh, that he's teaching. And he thought it was a, such an empty subject. This has no relevant, relevance of any kind to the real life of the people. So he's uh, kind of trying to figure out uh, what is uh, relevance of uh, any person. So I was trying to see, am I useful to anybody at all? Uh, or I wasted my time on uh, learning something which has no use at all? And what is it now that, to me? So I was looking for some kind of use for myself. What is it that I'm useful for to other people? And in search of that, I decided to visit the next village, next door village of the university, where the university is surrounded all around by the villages. So I thought the best way I can do to go to the real life of the people and see if I, in any way I am relevant to their life in kind of helping something uh, in my own personal capacity, not as an economist, which I thought is, uh, has no meaning uh, to many anymore. And as a, still, as a human being, I, I thought I have some deliverance as a, another human being. So I can be next to another human being and say, 
uh, how it can be of some help to you. Or even don't have to ask. Just see something and do react to that. It's just one person. I'm not talking about the village. I'm not talking the family. So even being useful to one person is a great thing for me. So I started doing that. Every day I go there and spend time. and became familiar and uh, started learning a lot about the village, about the people, which I never learned in economic courses. Uh, it's an artificial world of whatever assumptions we make in economics. But these are real people, real problems. And I tried to see if there's something that I can be useful uh, some way to them. And I did lots of tiny little things in doing that. And one thing kind of sucked me in gradually without me knowing about it. I was just shocked by the uh, tremendous amount of uh, hardship uh, uh, it imposes on people. Uh, the loan sharking. The loan shark uh, lends people a little amount of money in the process. They grab almost the last little position that person or family has just in the name of that loan. <clears throat> and you see that every day. It's not something rare. So uh, I was wondering, if it's so painful, so terrible, uh, there must be something to be done to help them uh, to not being victims of loan sharks. So I was wondering what I can do as I talk to them, I understand their problem. They need a very small amount of money, even $1 worth of money, $2 worth of money. That's what kills them, literally kills them. So I was seeing what I can do. One idea came to my mind, a very simple one. Uh, I said, uh, why don't I lend the money myself? If I lend the money, they can come to me and I pay, give them the money. And I don't have to go through all the hardships that they have to they impose, the loan sharks impose. They will be relieved. So I protect at least one person from the loan sharks. So that was a simple idea and uh, nothing uh, unusual that we can think about. So I went around and started telling people, if you need, next time you need money, come to me, tell me I'm here. Uh, I'll give the money. So that was the beginning. And people started borrowing money from me and I'm very, very happy to give the money. And that gradually started to became bigger and bigger and bigger. And I become happier and happier that, yes, I can do something which is which touches their life. That's most exciting than what they do. They start showing things, what they have done with the money and how they saved their activity because they had the money with them. And that was the beginning what you now came back uh, again and again, what is known as microcredit, as you're introducing me on that one. And what was it? Why was it because it's significant? As I was doing it, I got into lots of lots of opposition. And the opposition came from not one direction, all direction. Uh, bankers said, you're crazy, you're, this is not banking, why do you want to do that? Why are you lending money? I said, you are wrong. Why are you not lending money to the poor people? So controversy after controversy. I will make speeches in public places, accusing the banks, and banks get upset with me, and those kind of things. But I continued. And I said, whole banking system is designed the wrong way. That's my conclusion. Whole banking system is designed the wrong way. They're driven, they are driven by the principle, the more you have, the more you can get. If you have nothing, you get nothing. I said, it should be the reverse. I said, the banking should be, if you have nothing, you get the first priority. And you have little, you get the second priority. And gradually, the people who love, they get the last priority. That's the system. And they say they, are, they cannot lend money to poor people because they are not credit worthy. This word has been repeated to me many times, again and again. You cannot do that because they are not credit worthy. Then finally I turned around and I said, why do you say that they are not credit worthy? I think they should be telling you that you are not people worthy. First you have to make yourself right. Then you say something uh, for the other people. Oh. So don't accuse them for your failure. So I said, you fix, fix, it, your, fix it yourself. Then you can talk about what the other people can do. People can go, never go wrong. Your, your job is to make sure it fits into their life. You are no fit for, for their life. So that became very stronger and stronger. So finally, to make a long story short, I created the bank and became known, etc. And people keep asking me, how did you do that? How did you design that thing? I never thought I would be running a bank. Suddenly I pushed into that. Now I'm talking about banking debating about the bankers, accusing them, uh, cursing them, and all kinds. So I was very bold in kind of shutting them down that this is completely wrong thing they're doing. You are taking away the opportunities from people. Uh, so how did you do that? That's a common question. And then I, I tried to explain in various ways. One thing I thought got very easy to explain. I said, well, it's very simple for me. 
since I don't know anything about banking, I never took a course of banking anywhere. So I have absolutely no, no knowledge about it, how it is done, except that they are thing that you are supposed to know as an economics student. Uh, so I said, what I do when I needed a principle, procedure, how I should do it in this case, I, looked, I look at the conventional banks, how they do it, and I learn how they do it. Once I learn how they do it, I just do the opposite. And it worked. And that became the Grameen Bank. Everything we do in Grameen Bank is exactly opposite of the conventional bank. They asked for collateral. We said no collateral. This is a fundamental thing. If you have anything to do with banking, they will tell you, you need collateral. I said no collateral. If you need, if you ask for collateral, poor people are out. So I damaged, I destroyed that wall first time, that no collateral. So this is the kind of fundamental thing that I did. And then I said, uh, uh, they reversed everything. They, they always preferred to work in the city center. I said I would work in the village. I even called the bank as a Grameen Bank or village bank. And it's still, <clears throat> after so many years, since 1976, after so many years, it's still Grameen Bank works in the village. It doesn't have any activity, any branch or anything in anywhere in Bangladesh in the urban areas. So still we stick to that principle that if this is a wrong thing, urban centric idea is a wrong idea, the rural center is the right idea that comes, brings you to the real people, rural people and so on. So they go to the rich, I go to the poor. They go to the city, I go to the rural areas and the remote rural areas. They go to men, I go to women. Uh, they look for lawyers, we said no lawyers. So you go piece by piece. Everything is done in a completely reverse way. So if something is not working, the first thing, the lesson I'm telling you, if something is not working, you're, you're upset about it, Find the solution, reverse it. By reversing that, you get the solution. So I said, look, it's, it's a very simple thing. If something is going the wrong way, you have to put it in reverse again. Then it goes the right way. And that's a simple thing, you try, try to do that. As I was doing, I started seeing many other problems among the poor people, health problems, their housing is there, nutrition is for children, all, everything is wrong with the poor people. So I started coming with ideas about the healthcare, about the nutrition, about the housing, about the sanitation. I didn't think, want to ignore anything because I'm not a businessman or anything. I'm trying to see I, if I can be helpful to other people. I see there's no toilet in the village. Nowhere in the Bangladesh there's any toilet. So I started saying, oh, we have to have toilet because it's related to our health issue. It's a very important thing. That is spreads diseases. So after long discussions and so on, I started that if you want to take a Grameen Bank loan, you have to dig a hole in, a, in the soil and use it as a latrine. So it doesn't cost you any money. All you have to do is to dig a hole. So that will be your first eligibility criteria. You may be poor, but you don't have that thing. You're not using that. We are not talking to you. So that brought a lot of pressure on them. I said, it doesn't cost you any money. So why shouldn't you do that? So I said, well, we, we should do that. And then started doing that. Then we came with the sanitary electric. We started producing sanitary electric in the villages and giving loan for sanitary electric so that they can have a sanitary electric in there. So it became a popular program. It became so popular, ultimately, as Grameen Bank grew, all the villages started having their own sanitary electric. It's a business way. And they were malnourished, so we brought the healthcare program. We had the healthcare insurance program. Uh, we brought the healthcare centers. Again, in a way, we covered the cost. Always we are trying to do the covering cost. We create a solar energy company to bring solar home system to the villages, to every household, so that they can do that. We said, you pay the money that you pay for um, uh, kerosene lamp, for buying the kerosene, you use the kerosene lamp. So whatever money you use per month on kerosene, give this to me and I'll give you the solar energy. They thought it's, some, it's okay. I'm not spending anything extra. I'm only taking it as you have. So they started doing that. And we became a big company. We called Grameen Shopti or Grameen Energy. The reason I'm telling that this became the principle that I learned from banking and from also the business. This is the new kind of business. Business not to make money. See, again, another opposite. Conventional business want to maximize money, maximize profit. I created a series of business not to make money. That was not an intention at all. And we make sure we don't take a penny out of these businesses. These, these are the businesses, we call them problem solving businesses without any intention of making money. And people needed a name and students needed a name, academics needed a name, so I started calling them social business. Social business, how do you define it? I said it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. So you have two kinds of business now, business to make money, business not to make money, but to solve problems. 
Then I go to another fundamental issue. Fundamental issue, what a human being is. Because economists define human being as someone who's driven by self-interest. I said, forget about self-interest. Self-interest is important, but there's another important aspect which human being has, but economists never, never accepted it, never recognized it. Is one is a self-interest, another is a problem-solving interest, another is collective interest of people solving problems. So that is also a driving force. So this is self-interest is not the only force. One is the self-interest and the collective interest. So why don't you create a business to solve collective uh, problems? That is our uh, interest, which is uh, another interest beside being uh, self-interest. So self-interest already has a very elaborate system, banking system, then the, uh, the uh, business system, and everything. But the other one, which is a collective interest, that doesn't have anything because economists never thought about it. So we started building those things, and microcredit came as a part of that. That this is the thing that we solve the collective problem of lack of financial access to all the people. And I keep saying that all human beings are born as entrepreneurs. So again, another reverse. They're always looking for job. I said, no job, entrepreneurship. You are the entrepreneur. All human beings, I said, are born as entrepreneurs. So make that happen. So I started telling young people and explaining what it is. I said, you tell yourself I'm not a job seeker. I'm a job creator. I'm an entrepreneur. Then I realized that the, all people, that are people who are called in informal sector, actually, micro, this is a micro-entrepreneurial sector. They live their life by daily income, but they have to go to the loan shark for the money. I said, why don't they create a, a chain of banks, which is a micro-entrepreneurial banks? Then I said, if you create a micro-entrepreneurial bank, very likely chance, 90% chance, they will convert into uh, loan sharks taking this opportunity to again grab things from the poor people. So not only you create micro-entrepreneur bank, you must make sure this is social business micro-entrepreneur bank. The license should be issued only to social business micro-entrepreneur bank. Meaning you are doing the banking not to make money for your shareholders, it's zero profit for you, but solving people's problem and get your money back, that's all. So that's how the Grameen Bank is. That's why all the things that we have done as a social business. Then Corona comes. All these issues, again, come in a big burst of issues that people lost their livelihood, people lost their jobs. I said, look, this is what I've been saying all these years, that people are now, that the Corona came, stopped all the livelihood, they are now back to zero. They don't have any income, any livelihood, they're in the death part, death, death part. they don't know what to do with themselves. I said, because you don't, didn't recognize them as they are. They are entrepreneurs. They are, serving their, uh, their life, they're uh, living their life by just getting daily income. And Corona has taken away their daily income. Now they're nothing. I said, if you had this created this uh, social business uh, micro-entrepreneurial bank, they will be starting their own business and they will retain their thing. They're not just daily income owner and the victims of the loan sharking again. They are their own people. They can change their life on their own initiatives. So again, issue of changing their um, uh, and uh, banking system came very strongly all around us. And then I said, what kind of world that we have built with all those uh, uh, systems that economies built, is if you put them together, the net result is extremely dangerous result. The system, economic system that we created, it created a dangerous world, world which is about to extinct ourselves, all the human beings on the planet. I said human beings at the, at the moment is the most endangered species on this planet. They don't say it. They don't talk about it. They don't even mention it, that we are endangered species. They talk it in a roundabout way. Roundabout way about, yes, we are doing, yes, global warming bad. It's not bad. It's going to kill us. It didn't have much time. We are just about a few decades, three or four decades left to organize ourselves. Otherwise, we are in a countdown situation. Global warming will destroy, and that's what all the projections are saying. We're on the path of death. And that's why we are the most endangered species. Our house is burning because of the global warming. But inside the house, we are celebrating our uh, parties, enjoying our uh, GDP growth, our per capita growth, our uh, 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 prosperity, and all the technological achievement. I said, this is useless. If the house is burning, you are having a party denying that. Uh, what we have done. And you are the cause of that uh, uh, fire. 
So you, while you are partying, you are contributing to that fire, you are fueling that fire. You don't realize it. You don't realize it because you are addicted. You know that it is happening, but you are so much addicted that you cannot change yourself. So you continue to do it and say, oh, yes, global warming is coming. We must do something. We have to do something. We are always talking about something, not concrete, not a desperate thing. So we have to go desperate, make sure that we don't have that. And then we have the wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated in few hands. If you have a map of wealth and people in the same uh, map, people below certain income le age, income level, you see under $5.50, half the population of the world is there. Is half the population is daily income $5.50. That's the world. And then if you go to $6, $7, and more and more chunk of it. If you go to $100, you almost exhausted all the people. Then what, what is the life that all the wealth we are talking about? All the wealth is way up. It's not in the people. So the million dollar a, week, million, million dollar a day, they are way up. There are few people, million dollar a day. And all the wealth is up. So I said, look, look at this. Wealth is one way. People are in the way. In the, in the map that you have, uh, you have made, all the people are at the bottom, and the wealth is on the, on the top. So I said, there's a mismatch. There is no connection between the people and the uh, wealth. So and that gap between the wealth and the people, just not income gap, I'm not talking about that the wealth, concentration of wealth that happened is such a way that wealth doesn't belong to the people anymore and is getting worse and worse every day. So I said, this is a danger. This is a ticking time bomb. It will kill us. So I said, we have to undo the whole thing. We reverse the whole thing to bring the wealth and the people together so that it can overlap with each other. So that people and the wealth is not separated out, it's together. And that's the challenge we have to make. The last one is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is also going to kill us because it will remove us from active, all activities here. Human being will become the garbage on the planet. Then I say, it is not good. Coronavirus has made us aware about the dangers of the dangerous path because the, the machine has stopped. We are so eager to restart the engine that uh, want to go back again. I said, don't know. Your basic decision now is no going back. We don't want to go back to the dangerous world because we follow the same old road. We go to the same old destination. That's the suicidal path. We don't want to commit suicide. We have to build new roads to go to a new destination. Then I define a new destination. This is the destination of creating a new world, a world of three zeros. Zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. Because artificial intelligence bringing us zero employment, we want to create zero unemployment. So this is the direction. So it's your job now, young people's job, to build those roads. Unless we create those build, unless we create these roads, new roads, we cannot get to the new destination. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Professor, for all the interesting insights, information, economic standpoints, how we can make the better world place with the post coronary reconstruction program to achieve a world of three zeros. Uh, we would like to continue with the Q&A session now for the next 15 minutes. So, Professor, you previously or just said that people are born entrepreneurs, not as job seekers. So in the current situation of increasing unemployment and job economic downturns, how can we apply this quote to initiate economic change? Uh, first of all, uh, to accept that we are entrepreneurs. The moment we accept that entrepreneurs, we have to build the financial institutions to help that entrepreneurship come in, number one. Number two, we have to change all the education system. Because the education system is uh, always take pride that they are producing job-ready young people. I said, that's a shame. These are not slaves that you're creating sl good for slavery. These are human beings. I said the purpose of the business school, uh, purpose of all institutions, educational institutions, should be making life ready young people, not job ready young people. This is a big difference between the two. I said that's a challenge. So we have to start from there, creating people who can become uh, like, uh, and they will become entrepreneurs. They will be told in, in every school every, ever since you got into the school from grade one, gradually uh, bring the idea that you have two choices in life. You can be a job seeker or you can be an entrepreneur. And, uh, and also mention that human beings are born as an entrepreneur. So it's a nature of the human being. And if you become a job seeker, if you take a job, job is the end of creativity. Human being is 100% built with creativity and packed with creativity. The moment you take a job, your creativity is finished because you take orders. 
orders and creativity doesn't go together. These are two separate things. You abandon your creativity and take a job. Job will ensure you monthly salary or whatever, and maybe retirement benefit. That's it. But you are now signed up to dedicate yourself to serve somebody. That's all. But I said, that's not a human jo job. That's not a human journey. Human journey is to discover yourself along the way what you want, what is the purpose of it. So these are the things we have to address now and bring the different ideas about the social business that you have the capacity to do that, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship comes with the finance. Finance is the fuel of entrepreneurship. And the moment you bring the finance, entrepreneurship is triggered. That now you can do, you can do things. That has to be established. Then people become entrepreneur. With entrepreneur, you can have two options. You can create money-making business, so that's your choice, or you can create social businesses to solve the problem. And all, you can do both. That's also welcome. You can, in one side, you do the money-making business. You want to make sure your future is intact. You protect yourself, your family with the money-making business. At the same time, you solve the problem of the rest of the world. That the, yes, I can, I'm capable. I create social business. It doesn't take away any money from me, but I contribute to the world to bring these ideas so that they can flourish, they can expand. <clears throat> in the process, we can change a different kind of world. So this is a path. Uh, 3-0 world that I'm talking about. Thank you, Professor. So we have an additional question from a viewer who is asking, what would you say is the optimal environment for implementing microcredit and microfinance? Uh, first of all, uh, a legal framework is a very important thing. There is no legal framework for microcredit. You know, we talk about microcredit and it started, how it started in 1976, and all these stories are told again and again. And microcredit is very respected, well admired, because everybody talks very highly of that, about that. Every country wants to have that. We have programs in UK, in USA, in France, in Germany, in Netherlands, all kinds of countries. And besides the poor countries, because people immediately say, oh, no microcredit for the poor people. It's not that. It's needed every single country because banking system doesn't work. That's why you have, you see, I said, if you have any kind of loan sharking in your society, your banking is a failure of your banking system. Your banking system is sick because it doesn't take care of the need of other people. If you have any paid lenders in your society, you know, then your system is, is not right. Your system is sick because it didn't care, take care of that. So it, everybody needed that. So this is the kind of thing that after all these years, microcredit still remains a footnote in the banking story. In all the banking courses, you will never hear that except as a should not that yes, they do something different. It should be the mainstream. It didn't get the mainstream. Why? Because money making is so strong in the mind that money making is the business. So banking has to be money making business. So they can, oh, then they, they push whatever microcredit there is, is a, on the path to the loan sharking business. Microcredit becomes the loan sharks. So this is a fate of the whole microcredit thing. Very few are still the social business microcredit. So there's a right microcredit, there's a wrong microcredit. So you have to be very careful what microcredit you're talking about. And you have to redesign the whole banking system. It's not just an addition. They say uh, inclusive banking. I said, what does it mean, inclusive banking? You give it to some uh, small guy and you become inclusive banking, you have to redesign the bank. You, you, if you keep all your rules and regulations, everything together, and say, I'm doing the inclusive banking, I'm taking one step in a thousand mile journey, that's not inclusive banking. Inclusive banking means I design a bank just for them, like the guy, Grameen Bank was designed for that. So that is the challenging thing that you have to design it, to have a law, because this today's banking law, I'm sure you study the banking law, banking law is about creating a bank for the rich. So if you have a law for creating bank for the rich, why don't you have a law to create the bank for the poor? That's a simple question, but nobody does that. Everybody says, no, this is the only, only banking law. I said, this is a different banking. I said, it's an upside down banking. And people say, you have turned around, and the, uh, the accusation people make to me, they made against me, say, oh, you turned around the whole banking system. You made the whole banking system upside down. I said, yes, I did. Because banking system was standing on its head. So I turned it down so that it can stand on fit. That's what it should be. So this is a question of perception, why you, how you look at it. You think it's so correct. You, this, everything is incorrect. Everything is wrong. So we have to change our mindset. What kind of banking, what is a bank, what does banking mean to people? What does financing mean to people? What is the purpose of financing? If you say my, my purpose of financing is to make money for yourself, okay, go ahead, you make lots of money in banking. 
that's a sure way to make money. But if you want to see, you have to create the society that you desire, then you have to have a different kind of value. That's the challenge for all of us. Thank you, Professor. So we have another a very interesting question, which also reflects on your personal development. And it is, when were you most unsure that Grameen Bank would succeed? Oh, I was always sure that Grameen Bank would succeed. That's, that was not a problem at all. Because, uh, no, no. I said, Grameen Bank can dis disintegrate the whole thing, that my belief would not disappear. I would say, well, we made mistakes, but we have to fix it again. I said, anything you try to do at the beginning, you make mistakes. That doesn't mean your idea is wrong. Simply, your starting was wrong. Things didn't happen the right way. Your, your colleagues didn't understand it the way you want. That's something. So saying that, well, it didn't work, then you are not somebody who are really, you're an inventor or designer or something. Uh, it's like uh, something like you say, uh, Columbus going for a uh, route for India. And uh, it goes months and months, he doesn't find any India. And everybody, crew members are getting upset with him. Yeah, you're wrong, you do that. No, he said, no, no, let's keep going, keep going, we'll find the land. And everybody said, there's no land. We have to go with that. So he says, no, there is land up there. So that's the determination. You have all kinds of negative things. They're rebelling against you. They're going to kill you even. But you stay firm that this is where you believe in it and you have to, someday it will happen. So that's the faith you have to have. So I, I knew that it has to happen. If I cannot, if I'm wrong in the right first time, I try the second time. If, if, uh, wrong in the second time, I try the third time because it has to happen. And I keep reminding myself, Human beings can make all impossibles possible. That's the strength of human. So don't give up. If, as a human being, you, you inherit that strength. You, nothing is impossible for human beings. If you want to bring financial services to the poor people in a systematic way, in a, in a sustainable way, so that it covered the cost, it's not a charity program, it's a real business program, it co covered the cost, returns the money and everything. And that's it. And that's a challenge, but as I said, it's a challenge it's take, to be taken by human being. And we, we determined about it and make sure. So at any point, I was never taught, I, I was never uh, feel that, oh, it's not going to work. I said, well, we made a mistake, let's do it again. Yeah. I don't know about, sir. Um, so as we as entrepreneurs or upcoming entrepreneurs, how can we cultivate a creative, fulfilling environment for our employees? Uh, you want to be an entrepreneur and worry about the employees, right? It's okay. Uh, you tell first thing that you can be an entrepreneur too. So you, you're, you are as good as me, no, no problem. I got the money, you didn't get the money. I'll find the money for you, but get ready. Uh, because we believe in all human beings and entrepreneurs. So our relationship is different. I'm not saying that he's, he's the guy, I'm the smart guy, I can do the business, I'm the entrepreneur, I have the money, I can do it. And I, 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 I don't care what he says also. That's not the right spirit because I believe that all are entrepreneurs. The guy who's sweeping the floor, he or she is also an entrepreneur. It's a girl who's uh, managing something uh, in the store. She's also an entrepreneur. So it's okay. So we tell that you are all entrepreneurs, but chance, this is how I got the money. This is how you got the money because the financial system is standing by. Like uh, in your school, I'm sure uh, it happens in your school also, uh, all the recruitment teams come from different uh, uh, companies. Uh, recruiting agents. They come, they talk to you, how their good company is, they, how benefit they get. So it attracts yeah, students who are capable students from their organizations. Uh, I said, that's fine. They do that. They advertise themselves so that they can attract talented young people to come and join their company. I said, well, what about the financing organization? Why don't they come? So if you need money, if you have a good idea, you want to be an entrepreneur, here's the money. This is how we give you the money. These are the terms and conditions. Tell us what kind of idea you have so that I can finance you. My job is to finance you. I'm waiting. You are a bright young man coming from the system and do that. And those recruiters from the companies, they come at the end of your courses. When you're having a degree, you come closer to the uh, convocation ceremony of graduating and so on. I said, but the financing people come from the right from the beginning of your school. Because you can be an entrepreneur right anytime. You don't have to have a diploma for that. You see, this is a difference between uh, financing and the job. Job needs a piece of paper. Then according to the quality of the piece of paper, your job is waiting. But it's entrepreneurship, it's all about idea. This is about you. You can get involved with at any stage of your education, any st stage of your life, no problem. 
well, you can take courses here. You're still running a business on, on the side because you have an idea, you started. Many of our uh, very top business people who are in the Silicon Valley and all that, they left the school long before they finished and started their business. So these are good examples that, look, they, they, didn't, they didn't flashing their degree that I have a degree from MIT, I have a degree from Oxford, or I have a degree. No, but they just flashed. They said, this is the job, this is what I produce, this is what I sell. And they said, that is the real creativity of human being. I don't have to get somebody's certification that I'm a good person. I know I'm a good person. I want to do things, and I want to uh, solve the problem of the people. Thank you, sir. We've got many viewers asking, would you recommend us in particular any books following two experiences or internships for our development? Well, I, I would just say from my side, all the things we do, there's a, you just examine it, what we do. There is something called Social Businesspedia on the internet. You go to uh, Social Businesspedia. So you can see what are the social businesses being done in Bangladesh and all over the world. What are the types of things? We have, like, for example, we have social business centers known as you know, social business centers at universities. I hope King's College will have a you know, social business center too, where all the courses are given in social businesses and all the design competitions are held for designing social businesses and bringing social business in the sports world so that the sports people can become very successful social business entrepreneurs. And there's a unit social business hub, uh, uh, sorry, unit social business uh, for in sports. There's unit social business hub for uh, environment. So unit uh, social business for healthcare. So each one has a direct, direct thing. So you see what is happening in the environment field, what is happening in the uh, sports area. Like we are, see, so just to give an example, an interesting example. Uh, you, you know that the Olympic 2024 will be held in Paris. So there's a big competition going on before Paris was selected. And I made a speech in the uh, Olympic of, uh, in Brazil, and I made the statement by saying that the sports is a big power. This power is used by money making. It's a commercial purpose, nothing else. I said, it's a big power for social purpose. Nobody uses that social power. I said, sports can dramatize, dramatically change the world. If you open that social window of the sports. I said, everything can be turned into social business ideas into the sports area. Even Olympic and the football games that happen, cricket, anything can be converted into social. That was picked up by N. Hidalgo, mayor, who was attending the uh, uh, Olympic, and uh, this is the IOC, International Olympic Committee meeting. And she said, uh, she uh, organized a dinner, and uh, let me repeat what I said, and she uh, interrogated with a lot of other people. She said, we want to do that. We are a competitor for Olympic. You said Olympic in the social business. We want to make Paris Olympic as a social business Olympic. So I said, that's good. So then he said, you come and join us in designing it. We don't know what's a social business. So ever since then finally, because they presented their case as a social business Olympic, they get the selection. And I would say like the idea and they got, they're now preparing for 2024 Olympic and I'm integral part of the designing process. How? make that social business, uh, Olympic as a social business Olympic. It's a big challenge. I had no idea how what it'd be. I'm just translating what it should have been, how it can be done. It's a seven and a half billion euro project. So only simple thing I started with explaining to all the uh, board members of that uh, Olympic. I said, we have to make sure not a penny, not a penny of this seven and a half billion euro is spent without a social purpose. So that's only the first start. Then you see, tell what is, and I'll ask, what is your social purpose for this? Why do you do that? Why do you buy this? Why did you buy that? What is your social purpose for this? You have to explain to me. That's all I do. I'll explain. I have to ask the question. And I give ideas. This is what can be done. How the Olympic village has to be constructed. What is the purpose of the Olympic village? What is the purpose of the catering of the athletics? All the detailed nitty gritty of that way, all this seven and a half billion dollars would come. So this is an example. So you can go into uh, our uh, website and there are many publications of the social business and so on. It will be also listed in that website. So it's an easy way to, and also you can connect us, uh, write, drop an uh, uh, email and we'll get it. First of all, every university should have a social business center so that you can get this education as a course, as, a, as even a degree. Some, some universities offer a bachelor degree on social business. Uh, some even did a PhD on social business. So these are gradually coming. I hope 
uh, King's College will get into it and uh, make that happen. This this will be the permanent way of impacting on people's mind. Thank you, sir. So uh, the last question we've got is uh, back to Bangladesh. And it's um, how have you changed the cultural barriers and social concepts when you went to empower women in Bangladesh society and influence them? Well, one way I would say that uh, what we did uh, in 1970s, mid 70s, so many, many years back, 40, 45 years back. Uh, if you had visited Bangladesh at that time, in 70s and early 80s, you'd see women in a very different way. You go around Bangladesh, you'll not see any woman. And people, visitors will say, where are the women in this country? These are invisible people because you're supposed to stay home. Going outside the home is no, no, not allowed. And the more villages you go, the more remote you get. If you, if suddenly, if you have an unknown person from, for her perspective or something, she was outside the home, she saw someone unknown, immediately she rushed back to her home. Immediately. This is her impulse. She goes to that. So that's her protection. She doesn't want to be exposed to any unknown person. Now, all said and none, you come back to Bangladesh today, go anywhere in Bangladesh, women will be the first one to come and greet you and say, where are you from? What, why you come to our village? And why didn't you come and visit our home? And that's the dramatic difference that you'll see. Women were always at the back. They were no, nobody in the in, in family. Even, even in the poorest family, you are nobody. In the richest family, you are nobody. Because you have no, no status in this way. Today, it's upside down. It's all the women in the poor families, they have a voice. Because she's an income earner. And she has a bank account. And millions and millions of them, not just few, millions of them. Grameen Bank is only one part today. There are many other microcredit programs in Bangladesh. So untouched people who are not connected with the microcredit, very real. Not only she has, a, she has money coming, she's in starting a business. And sometimes her husband is a kind of a partner with her, uh, collaborating with her. But she's the main person. She's the CEO of the business. She is the CEO, 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 CEO of the company. And she has a bank account. Just to mention, Grameen Bank today lends out about $3 billion worth of money every year. With no collateral, no papers, money comes back. That's not the story. The story is every borrower of Grameen Bank has to have a savings account. This is early, from early on, we started that. Everybody joked about it. What do you do with a penny savings and uh, a couple of pennies every week and so on? What will happen to that? I said, well, this is their money. They say they save some money out of all the things they do. They are poor, but they can also save money a little bit. And I used to give examples of how it is done by the women in the household and so on. Uh, so they did it. Today, it's all reversed. The reverse in a way, today they have $3 billion in loan. If you look at the total deposits in all the savings accounts they have in Bangladesh in microcredit income in bank, is more than the $3 billion. So their savings is bigger than the total loans they have taken from the bank. And I tell the bank staff, I said, look, you keep telling them that your borrowers are there, your borrowers, they are not your borrowers. You have to change your terminology now. You are the borrower. They are the lender because you have more money from them than you gave them. So net borrowing is on your side. So that's the turning around. So these are the kind of few points that you can see. And then next generation, she built, she went to school because Gamin Bank provided all the facility and make sure that all the children go to school. So now they're elite. The previous generation who started with Gamin Bank, those are now elderly people, uh, they're illiterate, totally illiterate. We are the first one to tell them how to, or help them to sign their name, the simplest part of their name, a three word, name so that you can write that name without knowing what the alphabet is, just as a picture, so that they feel proud that I can sign my name, at least that. And they said, I'm educated, I can sign my name. And they feel very strong that they can do that without recognizing what they have done. Uh, then they wanted to make sure that the children go to school and we help them to go to school. So entire generation that came out, is it education, they are going to school, they have done the school, they have gone to college, some of them go to university, some of them have PhDs, some many universities, many engineers, many doctors came out of this poor campus. 
because Grameen Bank gives scholarships, Grameen Bank gave uh, student loans. So this is how, so you turn around the completely women, men, doesn't matter. Women are especially uh, focused so that they can have good education. They don't have to follow the same old routine that their forefathers and foremothers did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yunus. Unfortunately, this is all that we've got time for today. So hence, now it's my pleasure to hand over to me. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd just like to close this keynote with a huge thank you to Professor Yunus, who has kindly given up his time today to share his wisdom and experience with us. There was some brilliant advice in there that we can all implement and take away. I shall certainly be checking out the social business PDF myself. That's Thank you good. also to Akib for co-hosting this event with me. And I hope that you have all found this webinar helpful. If you have any questions regarding King's Business Club, please do not hesitate to get in touch. Also, if we didn't have time to answer your question, then please find Professor Eunice's website in the description of the YouTube live stream. Once again, thank you very much, Professor Eunice, for joining us today, and thank you all for listening.